town select board. Looks like we have a full board. Um, we've got Katrina and Sasha and Cheryl here as well with uh, we've got a few guests. So um, let's go ahead with general public comment. Do we have, go ahead. Um, public comment? Yes. I'm actually here about the subdivision regs, but in your public comment um, arena, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I hope that the board isn't seriously considering throwing up Bradley Road. And I don't think the town should give up anything it has. And those, we, don't, we don't know what beneficial use those things might have to the town in the future. I mean, certainly, as recreation, you know, byways, they have some values for people hiking or biking or whatever. Just not in favor of throwing up anything that the town already yeah, I think we're just looking at look at them taking yeah. a firm, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I know that there was talk about that last yeah. meeting, but yeah, I, but, I just uh, read that. You know, I, I, as you know, I've always always shared that. Yeah. And yeah. I don't want you to throw up. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, well, so, I felt I had to say something just in case. But, no. You know, I have a problem with a few troubles of gravel, but, you know, I, I also don't think as a, it's a good policy to make improvements to a class 4 road to serve you know, property owners. But I don't have an objection to that. Just no. didn't want to see the road through. I didn't think you would since I followed the, what's the road down past my house that, was the subject of, of an ongoing lawsuit for a decade. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, I followed that, so it, it seemed like if you were going to willingly give something away, that would have been the time you would have done it. Like, like I wanted to, but I wanted to. I'm sure you did. And every time I drove by, I'm like, oh, why don't they just? <laughs> we tried. No, I know. That was a painful experience, I'm sure. Still feeling it. Anything else, Sheila, on the public comment? No. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I, have, I have something wrong. Katrina? I just wanted, uh, I sent you guys all the forwarded to the email from Bridget Neese about, mm -hmm. um, as of right now, there's no second kindergarten in Moortown. Um, and as of today, there's 21 kindergarten Moortown resident students uh, that are enrolled. And one of the things that she didn't address in her um, email that myself and a couple other people have brought up to her is that district-wide, we're not asking for them to hire a new kindergarten teacher because the district has enough kindergarten teachers. Um, currently in Thatcher Brook, next year, there'll be five kindergartens with 73 kids enrolling, to be about 14 point something kids per class. So we took one from what one, one uh, teacher from Moortown moved it over, or sorry, from Waterbury moved it over. There would still only be 18 kids per class, which is less than 21. That's here. Also, the, um, the state standard is 20, and it also is HUUSD, it's on their website. Mm -hmm. So why when we hit 21, we didn't automatically go to two classes? It's, it's frustrating. Is kindergarten folks? Yes, five days full time. So they have a meeting on Wednesday, is that? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah, will you be there to yes, voice was. your concerns? Mm -hmm. yeah. That yeah, I just, that's too many kids. I mean, for kindergarten, you can't, I'm, I helped sub for the kindergarten this year and there's 15 of them. That's too many kids, <laughs> put 21 in there. I just, I don't think they can get a good education with that many kids, so. And I would suggest that you, um, and you probably have emailed Christian and Gabe as well. Yeah, 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 I talked to Kristen today, yep. And mm -hmm. that's a lot of Peter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Does it help if the select board supports a certain position? Hasn't yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was, it was in the budget for two kindergarten teachers. No, I understand yeah. that. I've been following to it. In yeah. fact, I responded to her email message today. She didn't answer the question about postponing the meeting for half an hour. No, so they decided not to do that. I mean, that, I, that, that I think is ridiculous. And, and also, although she um, basically said that Peter put out misinformation. She verified everything he said and in fact did not explain why they allow people to choose who want to go to Waterbury, but, oh, not, but not here. 
I mean, she, you know, she explained a whole bunch of statistical stuff. Right. But kids have been approved who want to go to Waterbury. More town residents. Three more town residents. Just not the people who want to go to more town. So why? Right. She basically said, I think she that's something that we've done in the past, and we can just do it. And that's but there yeah. was no explanation. Yeah. Uh -oh. She felt why. hurt too. I, I actually responded that I really didn't give a shit about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she should, feel, she, she should feel grateful that someone cares enough about what's going on with the board to say anything. I mean, I don't care how she feels. Well, that's the thing. It's not, I, don't, I don't take it as something like directed person. towards Moortown at all. A lot of people feel that way, that it's directed at Moortown. I just want my kid to get a good education. Yeah. And if the district has the possibilities, then why don't they share all the resources? Yeah. Well, I think there is some... Uh, favoritism for the towns that carry the most votes. If you are a if you are a person who cares about advancement, as I know Nice does, um, then you care about having the most votes on it. So I think there is some favoritism toward the uh, those with the most votes. She'll disagree with that too, <laughs> but we'll see in the future. <laughs> Uh, but thanks. I know um, John and I met with um, what's, what's the gentleman's name from the Moortown? Um, Ray Daniel. I don't know. Uh, it was the group that's kind of meeting in town to kind of. Um, oh, oh, uh, oh, 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 right, right. Um, I can't think the name of it, but I know what you're talking about. Oh, sure. um, Jason. Jason. Advisory Council. And the yeah, advisor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So John and I about three weeks ago. Um, met uh, with the, the, the advisory council here, and, and again, he, Jason, is going to take our support, and that's what we do as a board, is really we support what the advisory council is doing um, mm -hmm. to the, these meetings. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's where we felt our support from the board is, is coming. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Oh yeah, I think you guys support it absolutely. I just want you to be aware that I mean, there's three people on my hill that says that. Probably going to have to leave if we can't have the same equity at our school as the other schools in the valley. She's, she's putting one thing on us saying that, okay, well, if we have 20 kids and we split into two classes, and then sometimes people are sick, that's like eight to 10 kids. Well, Faison has eight kids in the holes. So is she going to split that class up because she doesn't like the size of it? You can't. I know. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of <laughs> double talk um, that comes out. Yeah. So we're certainly. Thank aware of that, but we should probably move on to the otherwise. Um, David, now you had some comments as well, right? Why don't you pull a chair up? Now remember, David Speck, he's our administrator. Uh, two things. Number one, I'd like to suggest to the board that you appoint a deputy zoning administrator for cases where I have a conflict of interest or illness or extended vacation. I've asked John Weir if he'd like to fill in as deputy zoning administrator, and he said he would be willing to do so. If you decide that's something you want to do, then the state requires that the town have a policy on the deputy zoning administrator as to when they, when they perform and under what conditions. I would be happy to look through various examples of such policies and present them to you. Mm -hmm. If you could do that, that would be good, David. I think that would be okay. the That's last. A good idea. Uh, the second thing is um, I've got some proposals for the changing the E91 application and certificate. Um, E91 job is one that went with zoning. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds sarcastic. <laughs> Uh, it's turned out to be actually interesting. Um, but my very first call, the, the resident said, I'm a little confused. I'm asked to submit a certificate of compliance saying I've posted the numbers, but I don't have the numbers yet because you haven't given them to me. And he said, I'm a little confused too. Let me look into it. And lo and behold, the certificate was the current certificate. Um, asked for exactly that. So I says, OK, well, we can change that. So this one that is not marked, because if you don't mark them up, I can use them, uh, has got 
what I propose we change the instructions to an application form, which then has the instructions in it. And made a E91. Uh, no, somebody can have a This is the current, this is the um, So normally I wouldn't think this would rise to a need for the board to look at it, but it does involve fees. And that is correct. It involves what? Fees. Fees. Okay, the, the current fee is $125 for the certificate of compliance. And as I wrote the draft, it would be $125 for the application, and I didn't assign a fee for the certificate. So the way it would work is they pony up the money, I do the work, assign the number, the, the town's got the, the funds to cover my expenses. After I give them the number, they are duty bound to give me back the certificate of compliance and our, our arm there is that no zoning permits are issued until I have that certificate back. That's my suggestion. You can do whatever you want with the fees, ponder it over. Is there any other um, regular fundamental changes in the uh, application here? Anything? Uh, everything from here down is exactly the same. Okay. Up in the top, the only change that might be of interest is that I've defined that they have to comply with the state regulations for the numbers being three inches high and two and a half inches, at least three inches high and two and a half inches wide and of reflective nature for all structures. Mm -hmm. Before it didn't include houses, so that, why not? Why not? Why not? I only skimmed this, so I may be missing it, but I'm looking for the fix to the problem. If you have to attach the certificate of compliance, and the certificate of compliance still requires the assigned street number, um, I'm probably missing something here. So the attached certificate. Yes, it's here. It's the second page. Right. So okay. So then, when you submit the application, you still have to provide the E nine one one assigned street number. Right, but they're giving them both at the same time. And if they don't have an E nine one one, well, no, that's an application. I will give them an E nine one number. When I get I get the money, oh, I get the number. I call them. I say, here's your number. And they go and post their number properly and they give us back to this. Oh, okay, okay. But these are two separate <coughs> two these separate are forms. application right. certificate. The, the, I, I got that part, but this says that when you apply for this, you have to include this as well. But you can't finish filling that out yet when you do that. <coughs> Where are you seeing that, Jason? Right up here. All applications for zoning permits. Must be company. Oh, that's a zoning permit. That's it. That's it. Got it. Yeah, that's a little warning. I got you it. Do this, you're not getting a zoning permit. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, it's team that's going to teach you. That's the stick on the other page. So right now, currently, they're just paying that 125 fee once they got it, for getting it up front. Is there any other, um, you know, what's it costing us more? I don't want to charge someone. For all zoning permits, the fees are, are defined as being a zoning permit fee plus a ten dollar um, recording fee. That wasn't in the existing certificate of compliance. So, has ever, however, the town would like to handle that. So, why don't we, with your certificate, the recording fee at that point of ten dollars? You can add that on, why don't or we do it there? Kristen can consider it embedded in with the other one, as you wish. Yeah, well, if that's what we're, I just want to kind of keep the same structure we've had that before. We just, now it's um, clear when it's being paid. That works for everyone. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he's going to get 125 uh, initiation with the, uh, with the uh, for the 911, and then once he gets the certificate back, they'll pay $10 for um, recording. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the $125 fee, this may be a subject for a different time, but 
I think that seems like a really high number to me. Does it take that long to, I mean, is there that much work uh, involved in that, getting that? I mean, I mean that's you know, like four hours. In, in some cases, I've done them very quickly. In some cases, it's been quite a bit of time. Yeah. And that's partly because I'm brand new at this job also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe that's a discussion for another time. That does strike me as a little bit high. I think we could, you know what, we should, um, we have some history with this, Ray. I think if we talk to JB, I think we establish those fees with input from him. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that was something that came up. But let's let's look into that to make sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's reasonable for some of the salary of the 911 administrator to be supported by fees and some of the general taxes. Probably what's happening there. But we will, I think, I think that's a good idea. I don't want to make it uh, difficult for someone, but let's make sure we're covering our fees. Does that be a free design? The you know, sign? Um, <clears throat> Martin usually. I don't know. Those are $60. I don't know. $60 yeah. yeah, I don't think that we bill out for those, so I think that's... Yeah, I think we do. But Can we check that to be sure? Um, so we know exactly why, when someone's... It would be nice to know exactly if someone's coming in to fill out an application, and what does it cost them to uh, submit? So, is the town to provide a new address with Yeah, so they're all, so they're all defined. Yes. The green one, the green Right, and that was a state requirement, mm -hmm. uh, I think, three or four years ago. Federal. Federal. Yeah. Federal. Federal. yeah. Um, so, but this is, if, says that the road is already named. So, I mean, well, in some cases, the road's not named. Well, and no, it says case. that the road is named, but no loan number side, please submit with the $125 date. So, nothing could go toward naming the road because they've already been named. Are you talking a road name or are you talking a. The sign. A, Each end the sign. The green signs. Well, I, think, I, I think, to me, if, if it says the road is named, it would say that it would have a sign. Yes. You know, I mean, you're just not going to name the road without a sign. I mean, that's that's what, how I read it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I was under the impression that it was the responsibility of, on a private road, for the landowner to pay for the sign on the road. I think that's correct. That, right. would, that would be correct. Right. Right. Well, separate from this. This is, I'm, I'm simply referring to the, you know, the 125 Main Street right, the sign, the number sign. Right. And I wasn't aware that the town provided those signs, okay. those numbers. I'll check it out. Okay. Um, I've been telling people they had to post it in accordance with the state regulations. Mm -hmm. I think, Joe, were you talking about the road name sign? Yeah. 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 So, oh, okay. They are provided by the town mm -hmm. And the yeah. house number, the 911 signs, are not correct. So. How's everything else going up there, David? Learning experiences. <laughs> yeah. You've seen, uh, how about applications coming in? Fair amount or? A reasonable amount. Some of these have been a lot more work than applications. Really? And uh, in some cases, uh, agricultural exemptions is a lot of work without a permit. So um, it's interesting. The, the house down the, the road that was a flood area mm -hmm. concern. Mm -hmm. There's been no permit submitted because it was all interior work. But then the flood area has a, came up as an issue to be investigated. And that's continuing to be investigated. And in fact, the, the gentleman has had the engineer, and I've received a certificate of elevation 
stating that that house and the ground right around the house is out of the base foot elevation. Mm -hmm. And that owner is in the process of filing a LOMA application, letter of map adjustment to have it officially taken out of the floodplain. So if that permit is approved, the LOMA permit, then it's done. Mm -hmm. So okay, I'm very glad I didn't have to tell somebody who's going to have to spend $100,000 to put this house up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Chuck, how are you? Well, how are you? Well, thank you. Are you ready for me? Yeah, why not? Okay, uh, so this should be pretty quick. Um, basically, the company that is currently hosting the website is getting out of the business of doing that, and so they want us to move it off. And there's just a decision point as to what path to take. Um, there's the cheap option, and there's the better option. The cheap option would run the town about $4 a month or so. Uh, the slightly more expensive but better option runs $35 a month um, or if you buy a year, $350 for a year. Uh, I advise the latter option. Uh, what it gets you for that additional money is it's an environment that's specifically designed for hosting WordPress by a company that that's all they do. Um, and so they take care of a lot of the security uh, openings that can occur in WordPress and uh, just make the, the whole thing much more robust. They even take care of some of the upgrades for you, so you don't have to do that. Um, <clears throat> and in uh, the testing I'm going to want to do to upgrade the website, it'll make that a whole lot easier uh, because they have the ability for you to create basically a clone of your website um, in order to test anything you want to do. They do nightly backups automatically, um, all sorts of nice stuff like that. So. I uh, definitely recommend that better option if you're if you know the budget can swing it. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's it. What's that? I think it was twenty five a month or we had and we budgeted around five hundred bucks I think for internet. So I would it'll be my recommendation that we go ahead with Chuck's recommendation. Um, and you know hop on that as soon as as we can. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Um, should I connect with one of you two about, because we'll need our credit card to sign up? <laughs> Sasha? Sasha. Yes. Sounds good. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, we, we should. <clears throat> Your uh, water yeah. charger. You know what, before we move on, uh, Jason, do you want to give us a, um, a yeah, motion um, on the last? I move that we accept the proposal to be changed to the E911 application and certificate of compliance. Second. Okay. Callie, thank you. Any further discussion on this? All in favor, vote aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for uh, keeping this. If you haven't. Mark your copy up. You can save that for David to use. Okay. Going forward. All right. Um, we have bylaw stuff coming up, but prior to that, why don't we go ahead and approve the minutes for um, May sixth? I'll make the motion to approve the minutes of May sixth. Second. Any further discussion on those? Anybody? All right. All in favor? Vote aye. 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 I'll stay because I wasn't there. Um, all right, I want to wait um, because I think I have Carl and mentioned that he was, or he didn't mention, but I assume he's going to be here, so let's make sure we're, we're on the clock on that discussion. So let's go ahead and um, look at any of the new business. Is there any new business the board has? Ray, anything uh, new going on with you? You want to bring up? Uh, nothing new on my end. Thank you. Kelly? Nothing. Jill? All right. So why don't we, um, Sasha, do you have any uh, general public, I mean, uh, pardon me, reports or communications? The only thing I have is Martin came in and talked to me this morning that I had a complaint from 
um, this the only way that um, this woman's name is Ruth, and he was returning her call. I guess one of Stefan was in the truck and kicked up a stone or something. And he just wanted to know if the town would cover any windshield damage. It's not my Ruth. Not no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that one yeah. they'll cover. Okay. Hello, no. Uh, any other reports of communications? So, Cheryl, anything from you? Mm -hmm. All right, we had um, just a couple things. Again, just one more work. There was uh, the note from Richard Bellantinetti to the um, John and Darlene Martin, not no reserve, uh, no uh, relative to me. Thank you. Uh, as far as that property on the Busca property, rescinded the um, condemnation order there. Also, Richard's been busy. He's also done a, um, a well visit inspection at a uh, property at 778 Route 100B. And he sent, and that's a Frank Piazza um, property. And so he, there's a few things that need to be uh, looked at there. And he also revisited uh, Shane Grace's property, and that is now in um, compliance as well. Cheryl, can you just, or um, Sasha, let us know where the stand as far as um, the sidewalks, just for public, and I think we all know, but as far as where we're at. Um, so Doug Henson is, uh, we're all clear from the state of Vermont to get moving on the project on the bid process. So Doug Henson is preparing the final plans and the RFP to go out shortly for construction. So we think um, certainly by the first week in June, we can do that, we can probably get those RFPs out, um, look for a construction, um, you know, by the, the end of this summer on that. And we actually came close to not getting a grant on the engineering study out here, but Cheryl and Pam DeAndrea appealed. And so actually since our last meeting, we were declined and then they appealed and it's been approved. So that's that was Pam. That was the last yeah. last piece of the puzzle. Pam's expert awarding of knowledge to um, that, that was a nice turnaround on that because that, that was, was excellent. Yeah, yeah. A sixty thousand dollar grant that's gonna enable us to uh, provide a uh, a final parking lot design. Um, so it could have been I mean that'll help that project by a couple of years, otherwise we would have had a resubmit for, so that was very, um, very good, well done, thanks. I contacted Ray Dagle today to let them know that they would be happy, that they would be needing to budget the town's share, the school's share of that, about $5,000. So the town will have to budget $5,000 for the share to, for the final design. And Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission will be doing the RFP for proposals. All right, so it looks like the range of it. I did have a comment uh, regarding the sidewalk project, and that would be uh, are we going to, I think we talked about having two completion dates, one this year, and possibly as long as that one next year. Just because I think it's going to be a real difficult time for somebody to do the project this year, possibly. But what I'm seeing, um, um, <clears throat> so I think it might, price-wise, it might work out to have an alternate or a completion date of next year, you know, first of July or something like that, to allow for construction. Do we? Do you think it makes sense to? Um to do that initially or go out and see what we get from these first bids? I, I, I think it makes sense initially mm -hmm. mm -hmm. to right. do that. I think, I think it's, 
the part because of, I think a lot of bidders may look at the, the completion bid this year and just throw it right out. And you set it up as an option A, option B, so you get prices on both. You really need to do both, and then you can decide if it's worth it to us. Right. That's the best thing ever. Isn't it just one price? No, I don't. Well, I was thinking it'd be priced differently because I, I think, I think it's, I think it could be two prices. I think we should have both options priced. Okay. okay. The other thing we need to um, remember, we're trying to coordinate with the paving of 100 right. out here as well. Which so, is, you know what that's going to be? This year. It is going to be. Yeah. So that, that may be, that so, may be. Yeah, you know, I talked to Doug about that a little bit. So that, and that's why we didn't have an option for um, prices for next year, thinking that the price wasn't falling within the budget for the grant budget to do it this year, then, then we would put it up to bid again next year. But that'd be after the paving project. Would have to be after the paving project. That's why we were moving forward mm -hmm. with really doing the project done this, this year. Yeah. And, and the prices didn't come back within the budget then. If, if all our bids were over the amount of the grant, can we go back for supplementary grant on that basis? Okay. Because mm -hmm. okay. they wouldn't want to get it off schedule and pay the room either. And that very well may happen because the project mm -hmm. has run five years. Um, and I already talked to them about that, and they agreed that if the bids came up over price, that they would have to amend the grant. We've already amended the grant once mm -hmm. um, to include the, um, the catch basin work. Um, so mm -hmm. the price for the catch basins and the price for the sidewalk have been combined in the one grant, which saved us a little bit of money because we're only going to have to pay the 10% instead of the 20% mm -hmm. of the catch basin stuff. And yeah, that's certainly an option. Right, and they're waiting. I know because Chris has been trying to coordinate with us on this project to see with the paving. I know he's met with his people with and with the uh, with Doug and what oh, the other guy that Pat, Pat uh, on this um, because last thing we want to do is see fresh pavement through here and then tear it up. I think yeah. <laughs> uh, but I haven't I haven't seen the painting project out for bid yet, so I'm just wondering if that is going to happen. It is I think gonna happen. because it, you know it's in the day. Mm -hmm. A lot of painting contractors. Well, I think again he's kind of waiting on this whole thing. I mean, if you watch, look back, watch those emails, read all those emails back, you see that he's trying to coordinate with us, with his people, as far as that whole bidding process as well. That's why we were in. Um, but did they trying to get these easements ready? Because if we did not have the easements in there and approved by the state by June 1st, it couldn't be done this year because of the paving project. So I'm pretty sure it's going to happen this year. All right. Okay. Thank you, Ray, and everybody. So let's go ahead and move on to the um, interim bylaws um, for subdivision regulations. Um, Karen, how are you today? I'm good. Good. So far. <laughs> good. Um, is uh, just, is anyone else coming from your group or? Well, I, I've got a couple more folks that are coming. Maybe Jonathan is coming. If you want to go back, so, but, um, yeah. I hear he's outside right and, now. And maybe um, mm -hmm. a letter here from Laura Coleman. Yep, and we'll get right to. Um, yeah, and I might just point out the reason we did not vote last time is there were no representative from the Planning Commission here. And David wasn't here, and we had a light board, so we decided that it would be best just to do it this way. Okay. Okay. So, Karen, do you want to, once you, you pull up in any of you, or any other people on the, uh, the board as well? Uh, where's yeah. Jonathan? Why don't you move up? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can, that way we can all have a discussion um, without having to holler across the room. Thanks. 
Say again? I'm weary of all of this. You're weary of all of this? Weary, not weary. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. So, so we started working on the subdivision regulations in the fall of 2016. It's, it's been kind of a long haul. We, we had a couple of public hearings with you. Um, then, uh, um, not to go through all those years, but um, last fall we had a public hearing with you in September, I believe, and then we made all the changes that were requested by the Select Board and Development Review Board, and, then, and, and um, quite a few by Carl as well. And then we, um, it was our assumption, because we had voted, to put the question on the ballot. Um, and it wasn't, there wasn't a ballot for it. So I'm hoping that you're um, willing to adopt them on an interim basis um, at this point in time. And then, and then put them on the ballot um, next, this coming March. So again, you started in the fall of 2016, um, and it was a, a um, a mistake, uh, there was supposed to be a ballot at, in March at town meeting uh, for this. Um, so uh, in, in light of that, the interim zoning, that can actually go for two years? Yes. Um, well, one of the, the, the ideas, or one of the things I kind of like about interim zoning is that if, if we have it for a couple of years, it actually gives us an opportunity to use it to see if it works or not. Um, one year may not be long enough, but if we have it for two years, we can see, all right, is it really, is it detrimental? Is it helping or is it really not doing anything? And I suppose it depends what comes up in proposed subdivisions. And, I mean, one year, it could be a couple or one, or maybe several years and nothing, so. Right, I mean. See how calm is it? Right, well, I mean, we're, we're, it's really not a big ask. I mean, we're, right now it's going from, what, three to So to zero anything, three. Um, anything less than four, if you've got two to four, that's going to be a minor subdivision. And if you've got more than four or more, that's going to be the major subdivision. And, so um, but still three, the- Three or less, three or less, not okay, is minor, four or more. You said four or less. And you said four or more, so four can't go both ways. Right. Okay. Hello. Uh, <laughs> well, we have some division burnout to this. It just. Um, I believe in the statute you can also maybe extend interim for one year. I could be wrong about that, but I think the statute does a lot for that. So yeah. two and then an additional, that additional one year. Yeah. Yeah. The statute. Uh, thank you for pointing this out. It says that it's um, the interim zoning regulation should be put in case of emergency, but the definition of emergency is fairly, fairly broad. So could the Planning Commission make a case for the reasons why it should, on an emergency basis, put in the interim? The, the statute speaks about more than just emergencies, mm -hmm. other reasons that you could put them into effect. And I'll tell you that um, Towns all around the state have put interim subdivision or interim zoning bylaws into effect for any number of reasons. Is there a particular statutory reason you would say you want to do this because of this reason? Uh, hmm. I would say because it didn't appear on the ballot. It's an emergency. <laughs> yeah. Right. What statutory reason well, that falls under? For another example, the last time I think we did interim zoning was for that. Uh, Accessory structures on class four roads, and that hung around for a while. There. I think it was more than a year that it was just in the in, 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 in. Um, South Towers was in too. Sorry. South Towers as well was in from zone. Right. The, the one that, that I was talking about was that uh, you didn't have to go to the DRB if you already had a permitted residence on a class four road. You were. The zoning administrator could issue a permit for a porch or a garage or an extension, yeah. Right. So uh, before that, anything on a class four road had to go to the DRB, which was an expense and time for the DRB and just you know, right. So this way so we did it for that. I mean that certainly wasn't an 
urgency. It was just something we did. Two year for reasons? And yeah. Often when you're proposing regulations like this, and the process has been going on for two years, you're, you're really giving people an opportunity to do things, to do things that create a subdivision before the, the zoning bylaws go into effect, which is not, you know, to, to force someone to do something in a hurry is not a good thing. I mean, I think that's a reason where often towns enact subdivision regulations in particular as interim so that people don't run off and start trying to do subdivisions to get in under the wire. Mm -hmm. That kind of is an emergency. I mean, you've given people two years. And if you delay this to a town vote, that's now almost another year, which is really the first definitive time frame people have had. Because from the beginning of this process, it could have happened as interim at any time. And you know, I think so. I think people were maybe facing that and wondering if you should we pay a surveyor to go out and map out some lines? Maybe not. But if you give them a firm ten months, people are going to do it. Well, the other part of this is it gets, eventually it gets voted, and if it gets voted down, then it's not going to happen. But anybody who's been paying any attention has seen this coming for how long we've been at this? Three years? Since the fall of 2016. It's been a long time. I know we've had yeah. several. Right. So, I mean, if anybody who shot that, oh, where did this come from? Because they've not been paying attention. All right. Mike, in the back, did you have any uh, comments from the... Uh, uh, your board on this. Well, from the, yeah, the Lister? Lister's or, board, or yes. Person. Your Lister board. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, anytime you can provide Listers with additional information on subdivisions and new lots and things like that, that's beneficial to us. And uh, my understanding is that maybe subdivisions now will be required to have a survey map, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so that's always beneficial to us as we start to input information <coughs> new lot and have a survey on it so that there's clear that we find borders on it and allows us to be more accurate in our assessments on the property. Thanks, Mike. David, as a zoning administrator, do you have um, anything to share on this? Make us a, make us a nine-lot town so we can keep the state out of our business as, as much as possible. 
Carl, I know you have um, some skin in the game here. Do you have some comments? Uh, can you assure us that that's the case, that Act 250 gets out of the picture? If we put this in the... Uh, well, it's in the writing. <laughs> you know, unless you're above a 2,500 foot foundation or it's a commercial, uh, you have a commercial use plan, are you planning on putting in a nuclear power plant or anything? Well, maybe 10 no, years from now. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, then it's triggered on the creation of the 10th lot in a five year period in this, in the, this district. Because I don't think anybody's explained that in all the hearings I've been to. Well, here I am. Well, we've talked about it. And <laughs> yes, no we, one has talked have... about how Act 250 interacts with our local zoning. Who, who takes precedence at what point in the discussion? Well, actually, we did. Well, we don't need to argue. Who did it? Uh, Karen? So, Act 250 says, in a town with zoning and subdivision, Act 250 jurisdiction applies to the construction of housing projects with more than Ten or with ten or more units on land controlled by a person within a radius of five miles of any involved point in a continuous period of five years. It will apply to priority housing projects of 25 or more housing units, which are basically mixed income, but essentially more than ten units if you have subdivision and zoning. And, and if you do not? And if you don't, um, it's not five units, right? <clears throat> it's over four, right? It's four. Or if a town has not adopted both zoning and subdivision, oh, that's crazy. I think there's like four is like the gray area that's just the DRD has to get involved. Three or less than zoning administrator can do. I can send you the statute again. I mean, I don't have the whole statute here. We've, we've sent it around I shall see rather it frequently. This, what you so, read was handed out on September 10th, yeah. 2018. Yeah, it was. So it, it has been at a meeting, actually. And, and we, well, that's the whole packet. I think yeah. you have, Cheryl. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not advocating this. I'm just reminding people that <coughs> the flip side of that is there's more work for the DRB. Mm -hmm. And we haven't heard an, an opinion, have we? We did. Um, we did. We did in, well, I don't, I don't know if you've heard from them more recently, but mm -hmm. in December, we incorporated all their proposed um, changes to the proposed subdivision bylaw. Right, because uh, a lot of the changes came from either John or Paula, I think, have, you guys have a couple changes in that one? Right. Okay. Yeah. So we have buy-in from the DRB now? Paula? Uh, buy-in from you guys? We, we do have yeah. buy-in from the DRB. All the members have an opportunity to review, make comments, and pass the comments to Karen and John and Right, I thought we had. You called for it, remember? Yeah, yeah I, know, I, I know I did. I just wanted to be in public so everybody right, can just see it. Under your... <clears throat> Yes, it was. Auspices. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think Dave. Dave is There was a, a flurry of subdivision activity before the schedule. I have not had a single application since I've taken over. Right, so there's a, to Sheila's point. I mean, it's not like these things come up a lot. I mean, they could come up, you can get several in a year, I suppose, but there's probably yeah. a lot of years where there's not. But people are subdivided. Right. Uh, so, Carl, are you feeling more comfortable now that you've got that information? Well, I'd like to hear that, but uh, I'm still disappointed that um, we have to do this as an interim bylaw now. It should have been voted on. It was scheduled to be voted on. It wasn't. Um, if you can just put them in the interim bylaws, you can. The way you're looking at it is we could do just about anything with interim bylaws. Um, it's not really, to me, it's not. It doesn't meet the threshold that I think you need to put it in place as an interim bylaw. All right, well, that's so, something? Sure. So the um, cell tower over interim bylaws, the, what else did you say? Forward. The class four road was <coughs> interim bylaws, the quarry was interim bylaws. So every major change that has been to the zoning regulations 
in the last 10 years started out with intramurals. Well, well and good, but that doesn't mean it was. <laughs> That's right. It means, it means you, have, you have the authority to do it. The question is, 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 is this a threat, a big enough threat to our town and economy and lifestyle and everything to warrant being put in as an interim bylaw versus being put in as a voted chain store zoning regulations. Mm -hmm. right. If we yeah, please. Uh, I asked earlier if there were any subdivisions in the past year. I know you haven't had any since you've been on board, but I know that we have at least two or three in terms of uh your transfers that came through the listers. I, I can't be certain on the exact number, but my recollection is there's been a couple in the last year that came through. There were more than three. <clears throat> I'm just saying I know there's some I don't know. If you need me to do it, I can get them and confirm okay. that. Right, right All right, Carol. 2016, seven, 2017, three, 2018, three. So yes. Yeah. How many over three or uh, three plots being created? Doesn't get that. I didn't get that exact. Because that timber mess one was three, but it wouldn't have been affected by this one way. According to the zoning administrator report, that's how many right. subdivision applications there were, and I think some of them were even approved. So some weren't approved. That, that's what the notes in the. It's a strictly out of the town report. I'd be interested to know how many over three, over that threshold, if it's under three, it's. I mean, it doesn't matter anyway. Right. Right. There was sort of no reason to keep that data until the regulations were being proposed. I mean, we also on the um, handout from September, in 2016 we had 41 building permits and 36 in 2017 and 2018, 14 building permits. But um, Jimmy at the time said, you know, he couldn't tell us what they were all individually for. So if, if we adopted the interim zoning, can we put an expiration date on it? Like, well, they do they expire. Um, I mean, they, if they're good for two years under the statute. Yeah, I would rather, what I'm getting at is, I would rather get this thing out to vote at town meeting. I don't want, yeah. I don't want mm -hmm. this hanging out there. I mean, I can support this if we can vote next town meeting in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing stops you from doing that. And that's your call. The only reason I was suggesting pushing it for two years away it was it would give us an opportunity to see, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, is it hurting anyone? Is it failing or, or not? But um, if we want to go ahead and, and uh, do it in, you know, 10 months, you know, next March, whatever, 10 months it is, um, we can do that too. I just. I, I would like to move forward with the interim zoning. Uh, these guys have put a lot of work into it. I don't see um, any detriments at this point. And again, I think um, it's, it's going to stop. So if we want to go ahead and, and, and vote next March, um, what do you, John? Yeah, what do you no, think? I mean, I, I think that uh, if it's, it's up to two years, so I mean, we can decide. Any time, if we want to have it on the March for now. But I think it makes sense to adopt it tonight. Right. But I think let's make a decision on when we when we vote on it too. Yeah. I don't want it just hanging out there as we have up to two years. Uh, we want to vote on it next March or uh, the following. I'm not sure how comfortable I am doing things on an interim basis that should be done by a vote. I'm just mulling. If if it's coming, if the vote comes up soon. I'm still mulling. Okay. Um, Mulway. Um, Kelly, what do you think? I think if it's going to be an interim, then it should be voted on. No, I understand. 2020. Okay, so uh, that's next? Yeah, 10 months. Right. Give it that time. Because that still gives you enough time to see if it's going to work. Sure. And it's not. I'd move to accept um, interim zoning bylaws presented by the Planning Commission. Um, with a vote for a townwide vote for uh, 2020 on them. No second. Any further discussion? All in favor, vote aye. Aye. And then. Uh, yeah, so four.
And to explain the nay vote, it's just a matter of if something should be voted on, I don't think we should make a habit of doing things on an interim basis. And if, if mine were a deciding vote, I might decide otherwise, but I'd like to have that on record. All right, so we will uh, we've adopted those, and we will uh, put it on the agenda that we're the warning to be voted on next town meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. With ballots next time. We can talk about that. So we, we took your opinion on the uh, zoning bylaws. By <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's move ahead. We've got uh, floodplain management. Uh, Ned Swanberg and uh, Miss Archer. I did bring a slideshow. I'm wondering if I could show against that wall even with reference. Is that what we're trying? Yeah, we're not pouring water against the floor. I say that wall would probably be better. Does this come down? Mm -hmm. It's not the plate. Are you going to work with the sun shining on that wall? It's going to be hard. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's going to be like space, though. Um, unless you have a screen or something. It's a town hall. It's a town hall, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. Let's try it over here. Let's see. All right. That's 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 Take up. Sasha, take this and turn it around and put it over that side so it's blank. Because the other side is blank. Yeah. Yeah, and it'll be white. I can't move. Right, turn it around. Right, turn around. Okay, we're gonna go for this wall. Yeah, I think that's and it's plug in right there. Yeah. Okay, and can I go center right here again? There we go. That's a strategy. Thank you. 
something like that. Sure, that would be great. Thank you. All right. Or PowerPoint that's in PowerPoint, doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go with that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to meet with you tonight. And uh, I hope you can see. Um, so this is, a, as I understand it, you wanted to understand more about uh, basically CRS and river corridor protection. So I just wanted to do a little introduction of what that's all about. And, uh, you know, just kind of put some framework to it and then, of course, take questions that might come up. Um, so this is, a, so we'll talk about uh, should more town. Participate in the FEMA Community Rating System, CRS, and or should uh, more time consider protecting river corridors. And uh, <laughs> this is quite <laughs> an interesting <laughs> challenge. Move the left. Yeah, move your. That one? Right. That's better. Each, each slide is different. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a quick map of town showing special flood hazard areas. And right now there's about 55 structures, plus or minus, that are in the special flood hazard mm -hmm. area. Um, most of those are single family homes. So when we think about these things, um, I just encourage the community to be considering a, a number of factors. One is you know, where are the floodplains and the river corridors in the community and what's already at risk. This is public data, it's online. Um, protect what works and avoid making the problem worse um, as a general strategy. Um, working toward you know, reliable roads and reducing risk for the town and for people that live here and work here. Um, prepare for an emergency because there will be emergencies anyway. And uh, making sure that uh, it's possible to ensure the residual risk because there will still be otherwise uh, you know, penalties and costs for things as we go along. Um, so what I want to speak to tonight is the importance of both the special flood hazard area and the river corridor area together. Um, these things are important aspects of assets here in Moortown. So protecting the room needed by the river and protecting floodplain functions, and that's really kind of carried under this idea of no adverse impact <clears throat> to those systems, and hence also to the interest of the town and the residents. So, making room for rivers, that's a big thing you can see in the bottom right, I have again to pass around about uh, some of the different resources that are available online, uh, one called Flood Ready Vermont, uh, and another one called Flood Training, and uh, these are uh, opportunities to, let me pass those around, thank you. Um, these are a number of sites that just have a lot of information on mm -hmm. of great use. This is a report uh, that I pulled down about more town from the Flood Ready Community um, data set. And uh, one thing you can notice, that it has some information, again, 55 buildings in the flood hazard area, about 26 flood insurance policies. So uh, just shy of half of the 
the buildings in the floodplain are carrying flood insurance right now. Um, it's about seven percent of all the buildings in, in the community. Um, yeah, in the upper right, it's kind of hard to read, but there's a little breakdown by ERAF. How many people are familiar with ERAF, Emergency Relief and Assistance Fund? Okay, so not so many of us, but oh, good, oh, good, a couple of us. So I will talk about that. And that's basically a, a program to support towns that are taking steps to reduce risk of damage from flooding. And right now, um, the community of Moortown has a, a rating of 7.5% which is kind of the default for uh, the state. Um, and in part, that's going to change as soon as you're able to catch up and uh, update your local hazard mitigation plan. I assume the planning commission is involved. We meet tomorrow night with um, central moderation. So as soon as a draft for that ends up going into uh, Vermont Emergency Management, the community will get scored as having a, a working plan for the time being. What does the percentage change to for instance? It, it changes uh, from 7.5 to 12.5. Okay. Yeah. So these are little dots are really uh, locations where there's been uh, damage. Uh, by uh, two, two municipal assets, primarily roads and culverts and bridges, that have required help from the federal taxpayers. That's, uh, that's your left pocket. Um, and that basically helps to cover the cost uh, during major disasters. So this is a widespread issue in Vermont. And ERAF is basically set up to help out in these situations as well. So here we can see um, after a disaster, federally declared disaster. Um, federal taxpayers come to the rescue of counties and states and municipalities and provide basically 75% of the eligible losses to the, to, the, uh, to the community. The difference is still pretty hefty. And so in Vermont, they've invented this ERAF, Emergency Relief and Assistance Fund, and that by default picks up another 7.5% uh, from the state budget and the community has the remainder. So in this case, it's still a pretty substantial amount of money oftentimes. Um, if the community finishes these four basic things, it's in the National Flood Insurance Program, which it is. It has an emergency operations plan um, or management plan, which it does. It has a local hazard mitigation plan and road and bridge standards that it bumps up to the 12.5%. And then if the community is taking the additional step of protecting river corridors um, or the similar thing, which is to join CRS and, and protect the floodplain area from development, then it would, it would maximize the state contribution of 17.5%. During uh, the event of Tropical Storm Irene, um, basically it was such a big event for the state that federal taxpayers stepped in and picked up 90% of the, uh, the difference. So um, ERAF wasn't such a big factor um, except for the 3% cap on the grand list for the towns. Where if the town had expenses of only 3% of their grand list, the state would pick it up. Wow. Um, so there we go. That's, that's it for towns. Yeah, it's still pretty substantial. Um, <clears throat> so the 17.5%, for that fifth thing, and again, there's two basic aspects. That one is that the community adopt protection for river corridors. We'll talk about that uh, with DEC recommended standards of so no adverse impact or, or more strict, um, including small stream setbacks, uh, 50 feet on uh, streams that are have more than a half mile, half square mile watershed flowing into that point. Um, or joining the community rating system, CRS, um, and having a standard of no new fill and no new structures in the flood hazard area at least. Um, VPR put together, as you probably remember, back in 2013, this mapping money, FEMA, here's a report for Moortown, which is basically that the community uh, received about just shy of $5 million from FEMA, uh, as well as other sources that were, were provided to the community. But the largest part of that was, uh, in this case, actually, uh, the National Flood Insurance Program, and some of that was because of substantial damage structures um, and then also public assistance again. 
typically after an event uh, of flooding damage and so forth, the flood insurance program picks up a fairly small chunk. Most of the damage that happens happens to municipalities. It happens when the road goes out because of culvert failures uh, or, or stream crossings, and, uh, and that's, that's the biggest impact. So floodplains and river corridors are important to us in a number of different ways. Uh, one is they're, they're actually important for water quality. Um, they allow the silt to settle out and not flow down the river um, into the larger water bodies in the lake and so forth. Uh, flood water storage is a really important part of what a floodplain does. It's where the water goes, and we don't want to have it deprived of a place to go. Um, it's often associated with you know, excellent wildlife habitat, no matter where you are on the planet, uh, often places of beauty, often places that people recreate and identify with uh, as, as key features of, of something that needs something where we live. And, and finally, it's more really important to us tonight thinking about public safety as well. So when there's uh, damage after a storm, it's, uh, you know, it's a devastating thing for the individual at the time, also for the community to think about where they're going. Um, typically after a flood event or over a bank or erosion event, people are on the phone, they're desperate, and there's been damage, and they want to help. They want permits, they want money, and they want to go in there and they want to fix the river or fix the stream so it doesn't ever hurt them again and protect their assets and their investments so that they can continue to exist. That's a legitimate need and interest, uh, albeit tragic, because if you get in there and you start filling up around the edge near the river or the stream and you berm it and try to keep the water in the channel or dredge the channel deeper and armor the bank, all these things that may become important to protect that structure also deflect the water and the energy downstream and across the stream, often at the adjacent property owner um, or into the town culvert or the road. Um, so it's a tricky thing to manage. So we end up with a situation where we're losing the ability for the channel to adjust and absorb its energy and slow down the, the flow of the water. Uh, we're losing the function of the floodplain and then other buildings are put at heightened risk. And this building as well might think now it's safe having put in ten or twenty thousand dollars of riprap and invest in making it you know, more expensive and uh, at risk. So this is a, a vicious cycle of uh, you know where you're basically damaging floodplain functions and increasing the risks on other structures on the community and creating a, a, a positive feedback loop with bad outcomes. And so the trick is trying to find our way out of this trap, which is very common uh, in Vermont and across New England. So Moortown, together with uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development and EPA, was involved in a process of coming up with this idea, how do we plan to manage stormwater and flood water uh, for a, a more you know, robust, safe outcome? The process that happened after Tropical Storm Irene. And basically it's in part by directing new growth towards safer places, identifying those and kind of making that the growth cycle where possible, trying to avoid putting stuff into a known hazard area. Um, and then in places where there are already vulnerable settlements and exposed places, uh, being prepared for the slow, expensive slog of making those structures safer. Um, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do. So uh, the community has a municipal plan, is working on a local hazard mitigation plan, and uh, these are also effective on the regional level, and they're basically to identify what are the hazard areas and uh, how do we plan for flood resilience going forward. And that's, a, that's a task not only for each community, but for the communities across the state together uh, to try to reduce the damage level. So a river corridor is, uh, basically built on the channel. So we're trying to understand how much water is coming down the hill uh, from the watershed. It has a channel size. And then liquid moving through landscapes tends to make these kinds of sinuous patterns to one extent or another, kind of going around obstacles, maximizing its, its erosiveness, and, uh, and then slowing down, and then speeding up again as it goes down the hill if anybody canoes or kayaks on a river, you'll notice those patterns. Um, so basically, 
as the river gets squished by new development, new houses and septic systems and parking lots and sheds and, and riprap to protect all of those things, the river ends up being bounced off the riprap and straightened more and more, and it becomes straighter and faster and more erosive. And it delivers more water quicker into the village and down the hill, and it does more damage on the way. So the idea is to set things back enough as we go forward that we're not constraining the path of the river. And so this is the idea of the river corridor. It includes the meander belt, this area that the river needs for the size of the watershed and its kind of least erosive path through the valley. And it also includes a 50-foot setback on the sides where you could have a stable bank with rocks and trees and uh, things that could be there without having any riprap. At the point that the river has accomplished, or the stream has accomplished, its least erosive path, because we've given it the room, it doesn't have a lot of erosive power anymore. And so it's easier to establish and maintain these kinds of habitat conditions and, and bank conditions. So why protect the river corridor? It's because the river corridor protects you. That's you because you are a federal taxpayer, a state taxpayer, and a municipal taxpayer, as well as you might be living by the river corridor or by the river. So the idea of no adverse impact is we're trying to keep what works already for the community. What works for the community right now is floodplains work. And if we lose them, we're going to be in much worse shape. And the river corridors are part of that process. So we're trying to protect the room that remains for rivers and streams and their floodplain functions. Uh, don't cause damage to others, uh, address the known hazards that are published and online, uh, protecting the people and the investments that are already at risk, our friends and our family, um, for reducing public and private losses, and aligning again with this larger idea that in the watershed, in the state, we're all working at this. So in the special flood hazard area, that has a, a special form. Um, and this comes up in the language of the uh, Vermont DEC recommended model language, which is, again, a, a starting point the community, the planning commission could take up and uh, look at and consider and make changes to. Um, but it's a good starting point for that process. Uh, but the standards that I just want to point out in particular for the no adverse impact standards are no net fill, not adding more stuff into the floodplain such that we're losing a place for the water to be and go. And uh, if there is a need to fill for some reason, then we would create space to compensate for that, where the water is allowed to go and deposit silt and spend time without crashing into the village. Um, and then the other idea is elevating the lowest floor of any new or substantially improved structure high enough so it's safe from damage. And in this case, recommending at least two feet above the base flood elevation. So that's particularly important, like a place like the Mad River, where this valley has not had a new study since the 80s. So it's the flood maps we have really don't deal with some of the more recent flood history and what's likely to be coming and what are recent trends in them. What is the base flood? So the base flood is the basis of the insurance program, which is just picked out of a hat as being a flood with a 1% chance in any year. And so if we had a, a base flood, a winning flood this year, next year the same ticket goes back into the hat of 100 tickets. And at time meeting again, we draw it out to see if we can have another flood of that size again. Each time we win, it goes back in the hat. So we can have in fact, you know, as many winners as we, we have luck, it doesn't disappear for another century. And there's some communities that we're thinking about two in the same year. So. Um, there we go. All right, so this is basically the idea of compensatory storage. If there is an appropriate need uh, for fill to elevate a structure or approach a bridge or that sort of thing, then anything that gets added, we would find someplace nearby that an equal amount of material below the base flood elevation would be removed to provide compensatory storage space. And uh, that typically wouldn't be across the river, but it's just shown that way for ease of view. 
So I have a question. Yeah. Go back to your last. Yep. So where your channel is right now, why not keep those channels cleaned out rather than let them keep on filling up year after year? I think our, we want to keep the water in the channel. We used to clean out these streams yearly, but so the water will stay in the channels. Why are we so opposed to that now? Okay, well, let's talk about this we go walk, and then we can circle back to that. But I will, I will touch on that. So, in Moortown, you also have different kinds of data that might be um, of interest to you. In the red on this map, kind of a red brown color, this is the edge of the official flood insurance uh, map, flood insurance rate map in Moortown, digitized recently online. Um, and then um, now there's been acquisition of high quality topographic information all across the state. And Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission did a whole process of getting the equivalent of one foot contours for the Mad River Valley, and a little bit more in advance of that process, and hired through another grant, Du Bois and King, to do a study of the flood risk in the Mad River Valley. So you may have seen a presentation of work with some of that data. Um, so this other layer in here, this reddish layer, is the result of that study that Du Bois and King did. So you can see in some places it's a little bit narrower uh, than the official map, and in other places it's a little bit more extensive. And they also, um, they map also the same discharge for Tropical Storm Irene on the same landscape, so that's the outside edge of all of that, which again is an existing data layer. It's not the actual boundary, but again, it's the size discharge of liquid moving through this landscape with a much higher quality um, topographic information. Mm -hmm. But when Du Bois and King did their revision, they took the same level of water that FEMA had predicted back in the 80s, so it doesn't really have any update of the more recent character. So no adverse impact in river corridors is, again, the basic idea of you're trying to protect the room that remains for rivers and their floating functions, and particularly this room to move from side to side and to handle the energy that's coming down the river from this watershed under the high flows. And the basic way that's approached is you don't want to build anything closer to the river than what's already in place, what's already there. As you do that, you really care about it. You're going to insist on protecting it from the river and, and inevitably forcing the river to be straighter and faster and deeper and more harmful down the watershed. So a protected river corridor, that's that beige area near the channels, um, is allowing the, 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 the corridor, the channel itself, to erode and to deposit and to move back and forth dynamically, slowly, over time, to handle its energy and its task in the watershed, in the, in the valley. And, uh, and so that allows people to plan for investments and so forth outside of that area so that there's no alarm, hazards, and loss of functions. So Moortown uh, has, like all towns across the state, has mapped river corridors, they're online, and you can see them by going to, uh, on the right-hand side, bit.ly, bit.ly slash flood atlas, and you can see both the special flood hazard areas, but also the river corridors uh, as uh, identified in the community. So that's a very helpful source to go review things. And this is the way the no adverse impact theory works out in the river corridor. So again, if you can just stay out of it, that's best. It's safest. It's the, the right thing to do. If, if for some reason you're trying to put something into the river corridor, there are certain times where the community could adopt language that would allow for that with some flexibility. It, it doesn't necessarily mean things are safe, but it would make it no worse for the community and the function that it already is. So this is one way where it plays out. So in this situation, we have the river channel, the Markham Street River channel coming through, and then we have a corridor to either side of it. Um, and so here we have a house, a red house. It's already 
remarkably close to the river top of bank. Um, and so the idea here is that in terms of using the no adverse impact theory, that this house is not actually safe, mind you. Um, but we assume that as the river channel erodes back and forth and sometimes close enough to the house, they're going to freak out and they're going to apply for a permit and invest tens of thousands of dollars to try to rip wrap and protect the building. Um, and if they wanted to put in a garage or a barn or another building that was behind that structure or you know just downstream of that structure, the rip wrap wouldn't have to be any more than it already is. That we've already lost the ability for the river to manage its energy in that spot. And if something is behind that, it's no worse for the river corridor. It doesn't mean that that new thing is safe or that the old building is safe, but it is a way of accommodating certain kinds of new structures in a way that's more flexible in that situation. And uh, also, when it comes to, in this case, the yellow object, which is um, a septic system. A lot of times those are downhill and even closer to the brook uh, or, the, or the river. And uh, so again, in this case, if you had something like that in place, then you could you know, perhaps put something of similar character underground or septic system that's behind or just downstream, within 50 feet downstream. And it would be no worse than the situation already is for the function of the river corridor. It doesn't mean it's any more protected. It's just this uh, way of cutting the, uh, the risk. And then on this particular piece, um, this is more of how the river corridor gets interpreted when uh, the corridor is moving through a village or a hamlet situation or an urban area. And in this case, we have two red buildings. Um, and they're pretty close together. They're, they're you know, a couple hundred feet apart, 300 feet apart. And it's such that there's no way we could really expect the river channel to come and um, you know, meander in between these buildings and back out again. That just simply can't happen. There isn't enough weight that the river channel can really use that space. And so in this case, again, if, it's, if these buildings are so close, then if something is built between them, but no closer than what's there, then again, there's no, there's no loss to the river corridor. There's no way the river can really use that space. However, it doesn't make that new building actually safe. That's a whole other issue. That, that might require some teamwork between these homeowners to, to pay for rip wrap and all that sort of stuff. But that's the way the logic of this infill situation works. And so that would work through, again, a village hamlet or an urban area. So um, on the flood ready atlas, we talked about the link for that earlier. Um, already, nearly 90 communities have bylaws for no adverse impact on floodplain or river corridor functions. So this is a, a very big thing that we've been working at as a state for a while, and uh, this is a, a big step. So CRS. This is a program created by FEMA through the National Flood Insurance Program, and it's really focused on the insurance element of things, and really taking, uh, finding a way to create an incentive for communities to take uh, a better, more conscientious uh, step of uh, floodplain management in their communities to avoid damage, and hence with less damage, uh, less you know, losses to the flood insurance program, and so by participating in CRS, uh, the communities are able to acquire a discount on flood insurance for anybody that has a policy in the high risk special flood hazard area. So in this case, you can see um, in the, <laughs> this map up here, uh, the darker towns have a higher percentage of their community in the flood zone. And the little dots are buildings in the special flood hazard area. So we have about 10,000 buildings across the state that are already in the special flood hazard area. Um, and so far, we have about six communities that are in the program. Uh, Redboro, Bennington, uh, Berlin just joined, Waterbury Town and Village, um, Montpelier, and Colchester. Um, Colchester and Brattleboro have achieved a class eight and that gives them a 10% discount on flood insurance policies for anybody that has a policy in the high-risk area. 
So um, again, you know, I think that you know, if more time is trying to make sure that people that are living in the flood hazard area have flood insurance before the next flood, and they don't come out, you know, wiped out, impoverished, wiped off the grand list, um, then we really want to get them to subscribe to flood insurance. Um, and this is a tool to help slowly reduce the cost. So that's, that's the intent of the CRS program. I'll also point out that most national flood insurance policies in the United States are written in CRS communities. There, most communities that are in the program are counties along the coastline, where the county government you know, does a lot of the work to organize the CRS participation, and it gets them a discount on flood insurance, and we have the most people that are at risk. And so communities in Vermont and and New England, we're paying full fare and we're actually helping cover the costs that are discounted elsewhere. So if we're not in the CRS program, on some level, we're kind of carrying some of the other damage that's happening around the country in flood zones. On the left, you can see the manual, which is about two and a half, three inches thick. And, uh, but it's, uh, it basically allows the community to um, look at its steps that it's taking and see what kind of credit it can get for that. And a lot of it has to do with uh, particularly areas that are protected from development into <coughs> houses and, and buildings that will require insurance. This is a quick synopsis of the communities across the state. And you can see Brattleboro down the bottom as a community is benefiting at about $20,000 a year. Montpelier, $24,000 a year. Um, in Brattleboro, again, best off per policy. It's about $239 off the policy. So that's, that's substantial as a, as a class eight community. And I've been working with Montpelier and we're hoping that they're gonna get to a class eight this year, we'll see. That's kind of difficult it is for a town of more town scale to achieve something like a class eight. Very difficult. It, it, <laughs> it, it takes a fair amount of time and administration, um, and uh, it takes a lot of dedication. But again, Berlin did it. You know, Berlin's a little bit bigger, but um, it was the easiest place to start is by doing this thing called the CRS Quick Check. And I can send a link to that. And uh, you can just fill that out, and, and this is actually, it's a little tricky because it's an older version of the manual. So it's not the new one. But you can get a quick sense of, given what more time is doing, how much credit is it And I can tell you off the top of my head, given the standards in the community and the amount of area that's going into protection in the flood hazard area, it's going to be extremely low. So what to do next? Um, so I would suggest, um, and you're already doing it, update the hazard mitigation plan. You go on your way with that. Do a quick check for CRS participation. Uh, update your regulations to adopt no adverse impact standards for the river corridor and special flood hazard areas. Um, and work with community partners like watershed groups and uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission to plug away at the mitigation priorities that you identify in your plan. There's lots, there's, there are residences, not only, as we said, in the special flood hazard area, but in the floodway, in areas with high velocity, um, high risk. And uh, there is funding available through the FEMA uh, Hazard Mitigation Grant Program that can help communities, help uh, owners um, get out of there, if that's, if that's something that they're ready to do. And uh, maybe along the same lines, I just want to say that the flood insurance program is uh, deeply in debt. And it's not getting out of it any time fast. Um, and uh, Congress, uh, particularly you know, Congress people from uh, dry states, uh, don't want to put any more money in it. And so the cost is going to be going up and uh, is right now on a schedule to rise every year until older buildings are paying for their flood insurance um, on an elevation rated basis. That is, how high is the water coming and how high is your lowest floor? And you want to make sure your lowest floor is high. Higher the better, higher the cheaper. In New England, 
most of our lowest floors are basements. And that's where the heater and the water system and all sorts of damage is going to happen. And the flood insurance rate is for the premium is extremely high. <coughs> so helping people get out of the basements and or elevate that next floor sometimes are, are the big things to be thinking about in terms of mitigation uh, wherever possible. So let me stop there and just kind of uh, mop up any questions that are coming up for folks and see if I can uh, answer anything. John, any of the public any questions for Mr. Swanberg? Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Um, I was trying to pay attention, but I, I don't think I really quite understand how you define the uh, borders of the river corridors in the special flood hazard areas, particularly in Moortown. Um, yeah. Is that something that you have a map that showed us there? Was that in that? Who's how that? you define the boundaries of the river corridor? Yeah. Yeah. I think I have actually oh, more yeah. slides. <laughs> you did. Another 40 slides. Yeah. You know that. Um, so let's see what I can find. Hmm. Um, and so when you did that, I was curious, are we in the river corridor right now here in this building by definition or not? Might be. So the, the, basically the way it would work, and this is an odd place, of course, North Town Village is, is a little unusual because the gorge. Yeah. Um, but basically, if you think a little further upstream or downstream where the river is moving through, you know, not a rock-bound environment, um, what you have is basically, again, the liquid is eroding and depositing in a dynamic way, which is the natural way that rivers and streams operate. Um, and so, um, what it's basically doing is it's trying to identify this area that's needed for the meander belt and then protect the banks that are needed for that to be stable. That's the basic idea. Um, however, in Vermont, um, well, actually, let me just say that you know, when, when rivers are steeper, they don't do a lot of meandering back and forth. They go crashing down the hill and you know, leave boulders and mega boulders behind, and there's really not a lot of meander and uh, any little bend you get in there is going to help slow the water down, but it's not doing quite the same thing. Um, in flatter landscapes, you're going to end up with more of these sinuous meander developments that you might find just upstream of here. Um, so you're trying to capture that meander belt as it exists, and then again the banks, uh, protecting the banks next to it. In a place like Moortown, in the village, where we're in a rock gorge, um, it also has this aspect of trying to identify, even if this is the ideal meander belt, sometimes there is an edge of the mountain, an edge of uh, the valley wall, where you can just, the river can bang up against it, and it's just not going to move anything, you know, for huge amounts of glacial time or whatever, geological time. Mm -hmm. So we consider that the valley wall, and uh, also if it bangs up against a state road, like 100 feet, we would call that a valley wall, it's not going to go anywhere. People are going to put that road right back in there again. So inside of those valley walls, um, the river corridor um, would basically um, be confined in terms of the meander belt. That's all it's got for the meandering. The, the buffer would still lay over that as well. But in this case, if you were going to put a building between us and the church, um, then you know, we would already look at the buildings along the top of the bank and we would say there's no way, you know, those buildings are, even if it wasn't a rock gorge, you know, they would all be uh, defining an area that would be defended to protect existing buildings and anything and further away is not going to make the situation any worse. Um, but as you get down into the bigger meander belts on, on both sides of the village, that you know, you can see more of the actual dynamics of the meander belt. So here, we've got a meander belt established. <clears throat> and trying to capture this uh, area. And uh, this is, so what's happening here is we have an existing, an existing stream channel. A lot of places in Vermont, 
have historically been opposed. You know, they've been routed and dredged and straightened and turned into sluiceways. That's a historical practice in the mountains when the loggers came in, the first thing they would do when they go up there to, to identify a new plot to, to log is they would hire the young men to go up there and basically drag all the trees out of the channel, pull all the boulders out of the channel and make it a sluiceway to get the logs out in the spring because they're going to pile them all up and wait for the high flow. So a lot of our streams have been turned into you know, high velocity straightened streams and then we put our roads right next to them. <laughs> so it's a setup. Um, but basically, here we go. We got a stream in the real and existing condition that has barely a wiggle in it. It's highly energized and dangerous. What we're trying to do is understand, given that watershed, given the gradient of this area, given the way it's supposed to work based on the science and the assessments that have happened across the modern around the world, it needs a certain amount of sinuosity to manage that level of energy. And this is what it would choose. And so this is the meander belt. And basically, every time there would be a crossover point, you would kind of identify that as the center of the inner belt and plot that out again. So, you're what talking about the meandering of the river over time. Are yeah. you looking at the geological data from years and years ago to see where it was flowing to define that quarter? Let's well, see if I have an image for you. Um, so, we want to kind of Finish this presentation yeah. up. All right. okay. Sorry. So that's all right, Mike. I like the question, but I'm just letting Ned. Yeah. Go on. So it, it it has been studied extensively, and in Vermont as well. Um, it's not about this particular spot or that particular spot, because we have aerial photographs on certain places where we can trace that pattern and how it changes over time since aerial photographs started in the 40s, um, and topographic maps, you know, from Beers Atlas and so forth. But for the most part, it's based on understanding the amount of water coming, the watershed, the gradient through that valley, and again, where the valley walls are, and what's, what's left for that meander function. And so you've identified that corridor that goes through the water. Yeah, if you go online to bit.ly slash flood atlas, bit.ly slash flood atlas, you can see the, the identified areas. Yeah. Is that the no, so it's a different thing entirely, but they're, they're, they're connected, they're related, they're important together. So the 1% the, the annual chance flood, the base flood, sometimes called the 100-year flood, but it doesn't come every century. If you get it once, it comes again anytime. But it's a different... It's a different thing. So the 100-year flood, or the 1% annual chance flood, the base flood is how high the water comes as liquid. And for FEMA, when they do the maps, they assume that the landscape, you know, always stays basically the same, and the water just kind of comes and goes. The house doesn't wash away, the bank doesn't change, the river doesn't move, uh, but it's basically pretty stable as it exists. Um, and so that's, a, that's again, this is all about a dimension of how high the water comes. And this is really, the river corridor is more about protecting the area for the energy to, to be able to come to its least speed, its slowest path down the hill for the area available so it doesn't come in all at once and have great power ripping out the side of the road and uh, ripping out the culverts and the bridges and the houses as it goes. Um, so they're slightly different things, but they work together. And uh, by way of channels, we're trying to avoid how the channels get deeper. Because when the channels get deeper and the water stays in the channel, it's very convenient for not getting wet. But what it means is as that water builds up and gets deeper and deeper, it's heavier and heavier. And as that slides down the hill, that weight becomes a shear, becomes a, a, a cutting device that's digging further deep and ripping out banks and taking out culverts and houses and dropping roads. So we're trying to make sure that it doesn't get too deep. And actually the water can, like it does in nature, spill over its banks when it has too much and spread out and slow down and dump out the muddy silt um, and not come crashing down. So, I'll probably wait a I have one quick question. Um, hazard mitigation plan, or is this expired? If we had a disaster tomorrow, are we stuck at 7.5%, or do we have time to get it in? Um, VEM, the uh, Vermont Emergency Management, is, is 
very interested to work with you. It wouldn't, if you had it tomorrow, I'll tell you how it goes actually. Mm -hmm. If you had a disaster tomorrow, or like almost we got hit by, you know, in a chain thunder shower today, mm -hmm. right? We ripped out a few culverts and things like the road. What would happen is actually it would take a while before the tally comes in, and then, and then there would be a federal declaration. It's mm -hmm. a month out already. Mm -hmm. Okay, the town's already paid the bills. Um, and then at that point, once it's, it's declared, then basically they would come around and uh, they would they would uh, declare this is the date we're going to pull the ERAF score. Okay, so it is not the date of the disaster. Of the no, disaster. excellent. That's right. And you would know, okay. <laughs> and you would be scurrying to get a draft down the hill so that they would take it off and say at least the draft is in, you know, and then you'd be good. Thank you. I feel much better now. Uh, so one more question. So, Once this meander channel is established, yeah. okay, so now this 50 foot here becomes this 50 foot here, here, here. So this 50 foot is a changing, uh, I don't know, changing the description or whatever. So at some point, you're going to keep on, unless you keep this wherever it goes, you have to clean it out somewhere or else it'll just keep on moving and this 50 foot will, will keep on redefining it, right? Actually, no, it, it's a good thought though. You got the right idea. Um, it's really trying to avoid that. And so here's, here's another one where you can see the, let's do it here. So this is showing, again, in red, the meander belt, right? Which allows for inside of it, um, for the channel to take its energy and move through that sediment or that gradient and come to an equilibrium of least erosive, slowest path through the valley. And then the buffer is beyond that. But this is a fixed area. So having done that, it doesn't require the entire valley. It just basically is trying to come up with the space that's available to do the work. And then knowing that, you know, you can build into these other areas. We can defend all these other areas against the river and bounce it off of those, but we still know that we've protected space in the valley for this least corrosive path to develop and occur and maintain itself. So if you do it the other way, which is the traditional way, which is only by setbacks. So only by setbacks says, you know, you avoid the top of the bank right now by 25 feet in town and more town or 50 feet. Well then this is going to erode at it, and of course, eventually it's going to take that spot anyway, you know. And uh, it's a dynamic system, and setbacks really don't work in this dimension or in that dimension unless you're allowing to come out to its full energetic equally, you know, equilibrium in the meander belt. But basically, you know, you might, as a community, say, even if you come out to the edge of the river corridor, we also want to make sure that. Or if it's sticking out already, it's already, because rivers don't watch maps. No, no. If the river decides it's going to come out over here because of something, who knows, it hit a rock or it hit a house, it's already in the river corridor, right? And it pops out over here. Well, um, it doesn't actually make this house safe, mind you, but we would know that we've identified an area that we're, we're basically going to be accommodating the river function. But shy of that, you know, the community might say, if it's already eroding at the edge of the river corridor, we still want to have a 25-foot buffer, you know, a 25-foot setback, just because that's so crazy close. Uh, but that's a, kind of a different dynamic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Ned? Uh, so, if the rivers were straight, which I guess in places it was all and now that it's straight on, I mean, how do you um, encourage it to create the meander thing? Because it's not going to do it on its own if it's already developed this channel. Or it might, in the case of like Irene, where it took out part of a road, we put the road back. So, I mean, it's a road, but that's the riprap speech that you were given. And in terms of like Moortown Village, we're really half a ravine because we've got the rock ledge on that side, when it floods and overflows, it comes this way. And like most villages in New England, there's like old houses here. So it's not like we can allow it to just, oh, come on through the village, we're no problem. So we're basically stuck with what we got, except in places where there's a wide floodplain, like just 
upstream here, like in Waitsfield, where it's just this big wide thing and there's not a lot of houses there and it's just there, it can do whatever it wants. So Waitsfield, as you know, has protected the river corridor, the FEH, the river basically the river corridor, and the floodplain from new development to basically not accelerate the amount of water coming at Moortown Village, which is obviously a wonderful benefit for the village. Um, because they didn't have to do that, of course, if they allowed it all to go into subdivisions and McMansions and fill lots and put in, you know, strip malls. All of that is not naturally acceptable for the National Fund Insurance Program. We would end up with this channelized, straightened thing with no place for the water to tarry and would all come into the town at a higher, faster level and more damage. So the idea is that more town as well could do that into the benefit of Waterbury and to the benefit of the communities. You go downstream uh, 100 feet along the river, river and the road. Mm -hmm. right yeah. So the point in that case is simply it, it is a lost cause. It's already crazy narrow valleys, you know, again with straightened rivers. I know so many places I drive and the road is like jammed right up against the edge of it. It's, it's really, really vulnerable, crazy. And that's a historical settlement pattern. You know, there may be times where towns say basically, you know, that road has blown out, you know, six times in the last decade. Let's find another way to do this, you know. I know towns that have, have explored that and have done that. It's very hard. Um, shy of that, what you're really trying to do with the river corridor regs is not allow somebody in you know, the one spot where there is a little bit of a gap between the river or the stream channel and the road, somebody's not going to come in there and put, you know, a little cap. You know, uh, another little, because it's a little place that nobody, you know, it's a cheap little lot to subdivide and sell off, you know. You're basically saying, look, we're trying to give the river whatever room it's possibly able to get. And that's, that's really the way it only works. It doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't. So you're kind of handcuffed because most of the yeah. developments already have a lot more river. There's, there are towns like Montpelier where there's lots more development that right. could happen. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying that there's still lots that could happen. And also, even on these steep little, you know, sections that happen, um, there's still often little places up the hill where there is space, and we're trying to try to maintain that wherever possible. The river comes up; it's not going down. Yeah. This this situation is a different dynamic with the, the floodplain. This is a natural constraint with the with the the, the, the basically with the gorge. Here. That's why the bridges and the mills went in here because of this remarkable feature. Um, so it doesn't make it an easy place to, to figure out. So just to understand the concept, <clears throat> yeah. what, what you're saying is this river corridor area for both the Bad River and the Moosey River is defined on a map. We know we can find out exactly where it is. And the, the suggestion is that the town consider land use regulations which would significantly restrict development within that corridor. Right. Even if much of the land is not in a flood hazard area or even in a 500 year flood hazard area. And much of that land is private. I mean, assume it could still be used for agricultural purposes, um, but no structures. Recreation. Baseball fields, softball fields. Right. And it gets tricky with baseball fields and softball fields because the trick is that within the river corridor, you want to do stuff that you don't care so much about. So when the river channel comes into it, right. you know, if it's going to throw off your lead, people are going to say, we're going to raise the money, we're going to rip wrap the bank, right? So that, that might not be the right use if you're going to have to protect it against the river. That's the trick. If the if the if the ball field could just kind of keep escaping the river channel, <laughs> that might be fine. Private property and people that own this land. Yeah. Um, I mean, essentially, the town would be imposing development restrictions. Yeah. Um, is there money available to purchase conservation easements? So a couple of thoughts. You know, one is that um, you know this these are. These are hazard issues. <clears throat> these affect all of us. And these are systems. The river corridor is, in essence, working for us today in Moortown. <clears throat> Not only because Waitsfield has enacted protections, but because it still was there to function for the community. 
So um, it, is, it is a function that is serving us, and what we're trying to do is protect its ability to continue to function. So it's something that actually is part of a dynamic functional landscape. And uh, basically the point is that we don't want to, as private individuals, um, stumble into a way that we're destroying that capacity. It's something that serves us all. Shy of that, <clears throat> there are circumstances where, particularly in Vermont, we've given a lot of privileges to farmers. And so farmers have, can riprap <clears throat> their banks to protect improved fields. And uh, they don't need um, a municipal permit for that. Um, they, can, they can do that uh, because of the, the nature of state law. Um, and so in those circumstances, that's a situation where the community through its hazard mitigation plan might um, try to work with community partners and acquire uh, what's called a river corridor easement on some of that land, which would give a, a financial benefit to the farmer in, in lieu of hard armoring the banks. So the, the channel would move a little bit every year, like it's always done for hundreds and thousands of years, um, but the farmer would have some income to say, okay, well, you know, I, I'm going to have to, you know, plant my fields a little bit differently this year. So that's a that is another opportunity for some. Insight that because ag uses are exempt from the farmers to do that, and the town can adopt this plan, and yet if most of the, you know, when I think of the Niagara River and the Whiskey River, at least in North Town, uh, it's bordered largely by ag. It's a problem, but you know the big thing is trying to get obviously the things we have control over in our lives. You know to work together, to you know use information about hazards, use information about systems, to avoid creating new problems for our neighbors, and that's what the river corridor and floodplain uh, protections through no adverse impact are trying to do. That we can work together to avoid more disasters for our 50 odd. Residents in town that are already living in the flood area. Ask for more. On the no adverse impact, um, how would that determined? Is the applicant have to bring in an engineer, provide an opinion that basically um, that the way they're going to do their development, there will be no adverse impact on the flood area? No, the, the model bylaw um, <clears throat> has language in there, basically, what I sketched out up there. You know, basically says if it's if it's infill in this area or it's behind and uh, or very close downstream, <coughs> these would be acceptable, you know, places that that could be where new development could be directed. Um, and then if it's a, a more subtle thing, um, you know, it's often possible for my colleague uh, Gretchen Alexander, who's actually a river scientist in this basin, and she she's often able to come out and look at it and see if there's actually bedrock features that are in there creating a, a valley wall that wasn't detected otherwise through, through ground assessment. <coughs> so that's a way in which there could be a refinement to understand what's actually available to the river and uh, help to direct <coughs> a, a proposal for development. Beyond that, it's possible to get consultants to do fancier, fancier things, but typically it works pretty easily that way. David? So, the people of Moortown have got two options to qualify for the additional 5% EFAS money. One of which is adopting the river corridor programs and their associated bylaws. And Moortown has already adopted a 50 foot riparian boundary. So in the small streams, there would be almost no difference. Once the watershed area gets larger, then that corridor is defined on that map right there. You can look at it after. It gets bigger, sometimes up to 100 and 140 feet each side of the stream. The other option is to do the CRS, which Mr. Swanberg discussed. And that has the benefits of the 5% EFAS money plus the discount to the homeowners. 
and that requires, if I remember correctly, bylaws which say no new development, no new structures in that flood hazard area. In Moortown, in most cases, there's very good overlap between the river corridor and the flood hazard area along the Mad River Valley and the Winooski. With, with some exceptions, and in most cases the exceptions is that the river corridor area is bigger than the flood hazard area. So if you adopt the river corridor option, which just doesn't mean the Winooski River and the Mad River, but also the streams, uh, versus the CRS and the prohibition of new structures, you will be affecting more people. It, it, it so you have to decide how you want to approach this and, and what the costs to individuals and benefits are. And then the question is, it, is substantial improvement of existing structures also prohibited with the CRS approach? Or is it just new structures, period? Uh, and also accessory structures. Just, the, uh, new structures. just new structures. Okay. I, I just wanted to clarify. The CRS um, has those provisions for shadowing and infill, which look like they'd be very useful in more town to allow a lot of building to be possible. Is that correct? Or correct? Um, <coughs> Maybe there's a way to, I think if the community adopted a standard of, of you know, like uh, no net fill, mm -hmm. that, that might go a long way, you know, like the compensatory volume, that might go a long way as toward meeting that next thing. Karen, you had a question? Or well, um, yeah, not, not to prolong this conversation, but I wanted to ask you about the conversation, but um, it's always been curious to me that, that this, um, River Corridor CRS uh, initiative sort of runs directly counter to our other state initiative to have compact settlements where um, you are directing all your development and those are, as, as Ned said, mostly right adjacent to rivers. So, a discussion for a different night. If I might speak though, it wouldn't allow any infill, and we wouldn't be a bar to any infill all through the street. Because of the no adverse impact approach, so you could put in skyscrapers uh, up and down, you know, 100B. All of that is completely acceptable by the no adverse impact scheme, and that's how it operated in, in Montpelier as well during the state review of projects. <laughs> so it, it, it's supportive and complementary in a lot of ways. And the other big way it complements is by protecting the real function of river corridors upstream and allow the, the compact developments to survive. Thank you, Jeff, one moment. Have any of the towns, any of the five towns that have adopted the CRS also adopted the prohibition of new structures to get the 5%? Um, Colchester? They did? Yeah. Okay. So one. Montpelier's not going to do it. I think, um, Brattleboro also has developed a standard. They would have to be eight percent or eight maybe. No, so uh, CRS has skating eight different standards all the way down to a 45% discount. Um, but separate from that is the ERAF standard. And so the ERAF standard basically says, you know, you're not making the flood hazard area worse, basically, as well as you're in the CRS. Thank you, Nan, uh, for that presentation. That was, that was very good. Thank, Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. I think going forward, we need to um, obviously evaluate this, show we have the other program that we already have, um, take a look at that and see where we want to go with the comments you've heard. Excuse me, guys, can you just keep it down a little bit? Um, 
<laughs> Karen, are you guys working on the HMP? Is that correct? The local hazard mitigation plan. Right. We've got the regional commission coming. Um, they sent us a new draft a little while ago. We wrote some comments on it, and tomorrow night we're going to be going over it. We've been working on it for several. We couldn't start until the grant money came. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of Sorry. things wrong with FEMA, and that's one of them. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. But thanks on that. We will. We should work together to talk about um, this this process and this this presentation here as well. And how we want to uh, move forward on that. Um, does the planning commission? Are you, is the planning commission going to weigh in? or study the difference between the CRS and the River Corridor plan? Yeah, I think we'll talk about that. Jonathan can't wait. It's <laughs> <laughs> a fascinating process. Uh, One of the things about this uh, mitigation plan is to make a deal with five, identify five hazards. And I think flood is significant, but the other ones, they have snow as one of them. People pray for snow. I mean, nobody prays for a flood, but people, so not quite sure how this all works. If this was just about flood, this thing would be good, but some of the stuff that it's just. Well, that's, uh, I think, the sheriff's point, if you guys could weigh in that way, look at both uh, opportunities here and come to you guys that would be good to them. One of the things that occurred to me was how many. Yes. So five times the adopted the CRS, I wonder how much developable land is there on the river in those towns. It's like a milk put back and it was full a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's easy to say no new development in the village because there's no vacant lots in the village. You know? I mean, so it's one thing to say, but it's another thing to kind of mean something. Is it just the whole thing more time restricted to the river? No. 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 There, there's lots of people. I mean, you can go to all down the road. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of standards. You allow skyscrapers all the way down the channel. Is that the subdivision there, skyscrapers? Let's put it there. Yeah. <laughs> Three or less. <laughs> <time. laughs> but you, I, mean, I think, I think it, if the community proposed, Basically, no man Phil. I think that might go a long way. Phil is a different. But I'm, I'm not sure. I think that I don't know if that's been fully explored. Go look into it. What's the Cheryl? Or what's the time zone? Where do we have to have one or the other? What is it? Well, now we have to have one or the other. Yeah. So right now we get. Seven and a half percent, and if we had one of these plans, we get another five percent for the twelve and a half. If we just had the hazard mitigation plan, we get the twelve and a half. Hazard mitigation plan is a no brainer. That's right. going to be ready yeah, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's to get to the there's seventeen. No there's no deadline. It's the other five percent. Mm -hmm. But there's not an actual deadline. No. Yeah. All right. So that's something we we should as a board. Basically, once the draft goes off the FEMA, they'll consider it. All right. All the way to the planning commission meetings, we meet the first and third Tuesdays every month. Everyone must learn here in the school library. The time you see. The time you buy off. Think about that. Thank you, John. All right, so we're going to move on if there are no other discussion on this. Thank you. All right, so we have some old business. What are the. So you guys went up to Carl's on this phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, Brad and I thought that, uh, and Jason too, pretty much to Brad, that, uh, you yeah, know, we should just have him, uh, or have Mark put some grab on the top for the section. Try and figure out a way of channeling the water over here. So the water right now is just running right down the class floor road. Really. So if we can channel that off onto Carl's property, 
Well, that's that way. Yeah, I, I guess we're thinking that we, we at this point, we're going to concede any right away, but come up with a plan for Carl to improve the trail, the class one road that's there, that'll make it work for, for him, you know, above the, above the turnaround. Right. Above the, below the turnaround, Mark was going to fix up the room anyway to improve the turnaround area. Right. But from the turnaround up uh, to where Carl wants, I think, uh, at least I, I was thinking that he would get a loan you know, permit from the town that would, I think would require me to the market up there. And I would certainly help out if I could uh, coming up with a, a plan that would be acceptable for the town that we could improve the right way. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. What well, it, it really involves some ditching, which I would think would be all in the car. Some ditch work and mm -hmm. things like that. So you want to basically just help on the plans to get it done? Is that it? Or, I mean, prior, prior to the program, we're going to fix that because we, we want to improve the turnaround. The turnaround. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, 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 and the road leading up to the turnaround. Yeah, you yeah. need to do a little work, which he was going to do anyway. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right. <coughs> but uh, without Martin being there, I just didn't know exactly what Martin was He said that last time. He was planning on doing it after the turnaround. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just working with Carol and, and Martin, and, and like I said, I can help too as far as getting a plan for that improvement that Steve wants to do for that area. But you can touch base with Martin and, and yeah, yeah. Say all right, we you know expect to hear from Carl or yeah. Let's I'll try to give Martin a call tomorrow and work on that. So meet up with him, tell him what we know where we would be. Carl and I then meet again. Anything else? Uh, just, I didn't have any problem with any of the alternatives proposed. It's just whatever would work. Excuse me, any other um, old business? Uh, just that uh, Cheryl actually has um, emailed me uh, the land management plan for our property back okay. here. And uh, it definitely needs to be amended because. It was done 10 years ago when we were still under the assumption of the shared land. So it makes reference to the uh, town and school and so on. So um, I will get in touch uh, with uh, Michelle Beard, because I believe she's the chair of the rec committee, and, um, and see what, you know, how much involvement they want with that. <clears throat> But I think that all the parties that use that property should be involved. And you know, on this, uh, when we do amend the plan, that um, you know, Mandy should have some say, or somebody from the school should have some say. Right. Uh, should at least well. get some feedback of what they're using it for. Yeah, they're exactly. Using it. Right. And, and how we and that right will all develop into the into the plan. So, and Ray learned that he's still our representative. <laughs> to the right committee stuff. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, I think the only other thing for old business is, and, and we may have approved this, I'm not sure. This was the painting um, job for the town, but there wasn't anything on, on the notes. Right? Um, it was the $9,000 bid. Um, is there any. Um, I'll make the motion to yeah. move forward with it. All right, any second for the discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And I spoke to them this weekend, and they're just a weather thing as soon as it clears up. They're ready to go? Yeah. That's just um, I've got an item of old business, too. Sure. Well, while I was out, I was assigned something to do the work very well. I wasn't there when that happened. But that was, uh, <laughs> so, Thank you. Um, I do not know what the expectations of this are. What, what, what's the board want? I'm that was where the board very Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, very low expectation to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Show up, and uh, I, I don't know. But, I mean, you've heard the discussions we've had around mm -hmm. this table. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically, we're just representing our interest, you know, around 
Yeah, uh, you know, I don't have to go to every meeting or whatever, but to stay on top of them, to keep them up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just let them know and support them. But you're good at asking, you know, if I have questions or looking at the whys behind things. Um, you know, I think that's a good idea. You know, keep that up there. Yeah, there are, my view is they're welcome to spend whatever they want, but what they choose to spend it on won't necessarily increase what we're, what we're willing to pay. That's, that's my take. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you're right. 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 Okay. Right. Anything? Yeah, but just you know, ten, ten mm -hmm. days and, and bring the back and forth. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you for giving me such an interesting assignment. Okay. A lot of confidence. Yeah. That's why we put you there. See, there was two of us not here at the beginning of the meeting. Me and you, and they flipped a coin. <laughs> Pretty much. You sure. lost. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then they, uh, we approved the financial review committee uh, renewing the CD and also for using the money uh, to pay for the truck. And I, I just mentioned last meeting that the, when we have full board, we just ratify those decisions. Okay. So, I mentioned which money is paying for the truck? Uh, the uh, uh, capital reserve. The capital reserve fund. And it will be paid back. Paid back. The other one was your decision on the pond. For a year period. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, that's right. That's right, too. That's right. And the other, yes. my notes too. The other one was um, on the um, the pond that Dan Von Trapp is, is doing, um, and that we waived the uh, footage, the square footage fee that would have added up to $1,250. Um, and the fire department said they could definitely use it as a fire pond, so we're going to waive that and we are going to help with uh, putting a road actually up to a road. Okay, I saw that in the edits or somewhere, mm -hmm. or you in some place. Right. Right. So. Is that like a win-win? Yeah, so, yeah. So. yeah. It's nice to have a pond up on that yeah. top of the hill. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. 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 You there. need a pond until you need a pond, right? <laughs> right. I didn't realize that. So expensive in this town to uh, have a pond put in. Well, it, it, it it's any it's it's a structure, and, and it's funny, it's weird. But that's just how it how it is in the ordinance. Yeah. It's, it's a square footage on a structure, so it's it's the same as what the house. Houses, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Was the part no, that we no, no, it is, it's weird. Probably mm -hmm. something that should be looked at. If you think about it, it's really only the engine that comes as a structure. Yeah, because they can be as easy as you want. Yeah. Well, well, not, not only, yeah, it's not on volume, but, but really the only built part is the edge. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So is that a zoning? Is that like a zoning? Or? Yeah. That's something we should definitely have that looked at. I mean, that was, like, when I read that, I would just see, yeah. like, but we're that's not, you know, that you would consider a pond and a structure like that. Mm -hmm. like, I can understand having an engineer design mm -hmm. plan. Yeah. yeah. yeah Mm -hmm. All right, we'll, we'll send that down to John. All right, so I guess we have some signing to do. Let me just personnel policy. Something we're supposed to look at. I guess I just saw that and I was. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, she wants to be able to have it done before she's done. And is anybody else going to be coming on uh, Wednesday? Is that for the insurance thing? Yeah, for, yeah, the drug testing. Yeah. I cannot. Um, um, you the will be there. Yeah. Yes. So, so I have to raise now. I also <laughs> have um, Cheryl, if that gentleman could come to our next or come over right. me, um, because I'd like to kind of hear everything as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. depends, it really depends on how it goes on Wednesday, but I would assume that uh, we're going to need to have them in front of us. Um, it's my understanding that on that, that we can, 
as a town, as a select board, we can choose to do it or not. And we could possibly get a fine for it or, or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Which would mm -hmm. mm -hmm. be So I want to hear arguments, not arguments, but just reasoning why. Oh, I'm sorry. So I just went through. There's some uh, uh, overweight equipments here, guys. So we get the new truck on Friday. Leaving. No one came home, so we got it. I think it was on Friday. I was. Um, at least I knew I'd follow the old one back to St. Johnsbury. Um, I, we did see the old one at St. Johnsbury because we did go to Sean had a new cable for Stratford. So we did see the old one. So I'm following. But he didn't tell me when the new one was coming. In. Well, I'm assuming they wouldn't take I, That would be Friday. I think they'd, they'd probably swap it at the same time. But so I'm following the thing. Definitely there was an electrical problem in the truck. No lights on the right hand side and the things are going off and on. I, didn't ride it. I was right behind it and it started to rain. And the guy had put his window down in the window, which I remember Stefan had been telling me the window doesn't have water. <laughs> Somebody's out and he's trying to get up doing one of those things. Look at the man the clouds. See in the back, this is for curb cut. Martin did sign it, um, but it's a smaller copy, so, so it's okay with Martin. So, Where is it? No, 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 so this is when it's over here, Jason, you get it all shown to you. No, 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 this is the worst curb cut. Oh, oh. 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 802, US Route 2. That's a bad idea. Highway says Ashburn Woods Drive. Yeah, I was going to be on the top. Is there anything else to get going on, folks? 